Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us at Grand Rounds today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anuradha Singh, who is board certified in neurology, psychiatry, and clinical neurophysiology in epilepsy, in which she is an expert clinician and researcher. Prior to her time at Mount Sinai, she worked at NYU, where she founded the Bellevue Epilepsy Center, directed the continuous EEG monitoring program, and served as the chief of neurology and program director for both adult neurology and combined neurology and psychiatry programs at NYU Health. She's been at Mount Sinai since 2018, where she's currently a professor of neurology and the director of the epilepsy monitoring unit at Mount Sinai Hospital and vice chair of outreach of the Mount Sinai Health System of Neurology Division. A very warm welcome to Dr. Singh. Thank you, Emily. So um, I've been here since October 2018, and I just wanted to first thank you for this invitation and would love to share what we do at Mount Sinai. So as some of you um, might know um, that we have two EMUs at, in Mount Sinai system. Uh, one is at Mount Sinai East and Mount Sinai West. Um, I have nothing to disclose. So the learning objectives of my talk would be that uh, we will just uh, start with some new definitions of epilepsy so that we are all on the same page. These have been recently revised. We will work up, um, we will, go over that what basic workup or advanced workup we do for patients with epilepsy. I will briefly mention some of the new anti-epilepsy medicine. These days we tend to call them ASM, anti-seizure medicine instead of anti-epilepsy, anti-epileptic drugs. And we'll go over some medical and surgical options for epilepsy. I am a clinician, I love to see patients. Um, as you will see from my talk, it will not have controversial scientific research papers, but more like practical Paul. So I hope you enjoy it. So the International League Against Epilepsy back in 2014 redefined epilepsy. When I was a resident, I was always told, don't treat the first seizure. If patient has two unprovoked seizures, then start the epilepsy treatment. Those two unprovoked seizures, once you determine they're not provoked and unprovoked, they have to be 24 hours apart. If you have three seizures in less than 12 hours, still counts as one seizure. One unprovoked seizure, but if you figure it out either through MRI or the EEG, then this patient will have a high probability of further seizures, at least 60% occurring over the next 10 years then it's also called epilepsy just after one provoked seizure. If you have a certain age of onset, you have a certain seizure type, you have certain um, epileptic abnormalities on the EEG, and if it classifies into what we call an epilepsy syndrome, so I'll give you an example. A kid comes to you at four years of age, has some staring episodes, you do an EEG and you have a three hertz spike in slow wave, you classify that as childhood Epsilon syndrome. And there, it, you know, whatever one or two staring episodes still classifies what we call epilepsy. What we used to call simple partial seizures means that there is no impairment of awareness and patient is going through these auras, but you cannot see any change in the patient and patient is 100% aware of the surroundings. I learned it as simple partial and complex partial seizures all my life, but that terminology now has been changed to focal aware seizures and focal impaired aware seizures. So in a lot of our reports, you will see the words used like FAS and FIAS. We do not use the word secondary generalization. That has been replaced by what we call focal um, to bilateral tonic-clonic seizure. The status epilepticus definitions have changed. Um, the patient really decompensates after 30 minutes of convulsive or non-convulsive status, but brain typically stops a seizure in less than one to three minutes. Most of the focal impaired aware seizures in temporal lobe epilepsy, which is the most common kind of epilepsy followed by frontal lobe epilepsy, parietal lobe epilepsy, and occipital lobe epilepsy really carry a very small percentage. So the most common is temporal followed by uh, frontal. 
So for the convulsive status epilepticus, that duration is more than five minutes. And we do most of our rescue therapies um, at home or in the hospital if seizure is, is lasting more than five minutes. For non-convulsive status epilepticus, that duration is about five, uh, 10 minutes. And I am having some trouble in advancing my slides. Can you see the next slide? Okay. So other definitions of epilepsy, that what is remission and what is what do we mean by resolved epilepsy? If somebody has not had a seizure for more than five years and they have they are seizure-free, medication-free also for five years, we presume that that condition is resolved. Um, can that patient who is seizure-free for 10 years have a sporadic seizure randomly? Of course they can. And that's a big decision about when do we taper medications? Then who do we call that they are kind of in remission? So either you are seizure-free for one year or you know, there is a rule of three in epilepsy. If you're, you're free of all seizure types and whatever your inter-seizure interval is, that could be once every year, that could be once every month, but it has to be more than three times the pre-intervention inter-seizure interval. So remember the rule of three and remember whatever is longer. So a rough example, you have a patient who seizes every month, has not seized for three months after you started a new anti-epileptic medication, and now has been more than three months seizure-free, but you are in the month of, you know, six months. So one year is a longer interval, so that you cannot say that they are in remission. There is a new classification of epilepsy, again, by International League Against Epilepsy. Again, you see there is a focal onset and a generalized onset. And sometimes we really don't know. And in the focal onset, you have a focal aware seizure or a focal impaired aware seizures. In focal aware seizures, the seizure is circulating in a smaller area and has not impaired the level of the consciousness yet. But if it continues to go on, then you go to focal to bilateral tonic cloning. So a patient can go through these three different stages. So this will be definitely disruptive, but if it is just focal aware, you can say that's a very subtle seizure where family, friends, or doctors cannot make out that they are having an aura. So there is a human epilepsy project, which is looking at new onset epilepsy cases interested in focal epilepsy and trying to learn the genetics of the new onset epilepsy, that which patients have a risk of having a second seizure and which patients say after meningitis or uh, you know, autoimmune encephalitis or whatever the etiology is, will have a chronic epilepsy. And they are surprised to see that patients report focal to bilateral tonic clonic that believe they may be having hundreds and hundreds of subtle seizures, what we call focal aware, Neurologists don't ask that question. Other doctors don't ask that question. Some of the patients with low socioeconomic groups or low educational background will not even care to tell them that, hey, by the way, I suffer from these other episodes, which I don't know what these, th these things are. You guys know that you know childhood absence epilepsy with staring gets misdiagnosed as attention deficit disorder for many, many years before a mother would say, hey, there is something wrong with my kid. The types of these two classification, focal or generalized, then gets divided into whether they have any motor accompanied feature or they are just non-motor. So one example would be just staring off in space, not doing anything or going through some autonomic symptoms, which can be misdiagnosed as panic attack or anxiety attacks especially seizures with insular lobe epilepsy coming from the insula can have a lot of autonomic symptoms. Seizures coming from amygdala area, which is the mesial part of the temporal lobe, can also have extreme fear and anxiety. But remember duration, 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 duration helps you in identifying whether it's a panic attack, which will be several minutes versus a brief seizure, which will be less than two to three minutes. So 
these focal are generalized, they get divided into motor and non-motor. And then there are some unclassified. Why is it important? You see a patient in the ER, you have no good history to figure it out. Is it focal or generalized? Try to pick up something which is broad spectrum instead of narrow spectrum if you don't have a good history and we'll go with the medications. Once you figure it out that it is a unprovoked seizure, always remember that there are mimickers of epilepsy like TIA. TIA is usually a negative phenomena. So you have weakness, you have loss of sensation versus epilepsy is a positive phenomena that you will see tingling, um, you know, traveling in a Jacksonian way and, and things like that. Syncope collapse versus, um, you know, a focal impaired seizures, anything which is recurrent, always think about migraines, migraines, epilepsy, anxiety, depression, they go hand in hand. You worry about other kind of uh, kinesogenic choreoethetotic, some kind of movement disorders like tics. 20 to 30% of the patients admitted to the EMU epilepsy monitoring units have non-epileptic seizures. So we misdiagnose epilepsy in a lot of cases. There are some syndromes or some attacks which are particular in children. So I will skip those here. Um, but you know, parasomnias, uh, some people do bizarre sleep behavior, especially in neurodegenerative diseases. That has to be differentiated from what we call nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy, which can have very hyperkinetic, very motor kind of a behavior. So what do we do? We do MRIs. T1 is overall a good sequence to look at the anatomy. So if you wanna look at, there is a loss of hippocampal volume, you go to T1. T flare, uh, flare uh, sequences, especially coronal flare, where you have thin cuts of the coronal temporal lobes is always good looking at the, uh, any scar tissue called hyperintensity. So the most common um, lesion that we see, and this is my personal collection of some of my patients, is what we call mesial temporal sclerosis. So the medial components of the temporal lobe are shrunken. It causes ex vacuo dilatation of the temporal horn because when you have atrophy, you have increased size of the ventricle. And then on the coronal flare, you see a scar tissue, which is like a linear scar. And sometimes with the, in the temporal lobe, it's hard to know, is it bilateral or is it a unilateral? But mesial temporal sclerosis is that combination of those three findings, hippocampal atrophy, dilatation of the ventricle, and then the hyperintense scars on a coronal flare image. Now the next one is a coronal T2 image where you have this really nidus of abnormal blood vessels and these veins called an arteriovenous malformation. This is a cortically based tumor which looks very soap bubbly. So there are two low grade tumors which are most commonly associated with very intractable epilepsy. The grade of the tumor is inversely proportional to intractability. A low-grade tumors are more intractable than the GBMs. So the two most common tumors that we encounter, one is called a ganglioglioma, and the other one is called the DNET, which this is DNET. DNETs are very soap bubbly. But the second most common abnormality that we see besides the mesial temporal sclerosis is what we call cortical dysplasia. As you know that the neurons, when the cortex is laid down, they start with this germinal matrix, which is around these ventricles. And these neurons, they travel and make a cortex. So anything that goes wrong with this migration to make proper cortex, whether they migrate and arrest here next to the periventricular, so this is called bilateral periventricular nodular heterotopia, this patient failed right temporal lobectomy. I'm not sure why right temporal lobectomy was done. Maybe the seizures were coming predominantly from the right temporal area also, but because of the bilaterality, some other surgical intervention was done later on, and I'll discuss that with you. Cavernomas are easy to resect unless they are in the eloquent cortex, and the gradient echo is very, very uh, good to look at anything when you're suspecting a vascular malformation. 
why this MRI is important. So you see a tumor here, which is subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, may cause some obstructive hydrocephalus, but you also see multiple abnormalities in the cortex. So this was a case of tuberous sclerosis. If I see this case, I do not go to conventional anti-epileptic drugs and I use a different kind of drugs. And then we do EEGs. We do a routine EEG, which is a snapshot for 20 to 30 minutes. You can do it up to one hour, but you can do extended EEGs also. We do standard provocation procedures, what we call hyperventilation. Because of COVID, we have not been doing hyperventilation, but we also do photic stimulation, which is some epilepsies are photosensitive, especially juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. And then we look for discharges, which can be periodic, when they are coming with us, some kind of a periodicity or they can be random. So I don't want to lose my business and teach you how to read EEG, but if you see what we look for, this is an epileptiform spikes. We look at how often are they happening and we try to see where they are making kind of a maximal field. And you know, always remember that scalp EEG has some limitations. Whatever you're recording from the cortex has to be perpendicular to the electrode um, and has to have a radial electrical field. You see it if, you, if, if it is perpendicular, is not right next to the pyramidal um, neurons where this electrical activity is generated, you're not gonna find anything on the EEG. So remember a normal EEG does not support or refute the diagnosis of epilepsy. Now, there are odd numbers in this EEG. This is a bipolar montage that we use very frequently. So you see that most of this activity has a minimal representation on the side where the even numbers are. So odd numbers are left-sided electrodes and the even numbers are right-sided electrodes. So it's predominantly rampant in the left side and it's predominantly frontal. We can do some longer EEGs. If you are ruling out epilepsy, you can always order ambulatory EEGs where patients go with, um, either it can be done with video or without video. Remember families can always make videos at home, but they cannot do EEGs at the same time. So no direct correlation. You can do a continuous EEG in the hospital, which we do in EMUs or epilepsy monitoring unit. Why do we bring patients to epilepsy monitoring unit. If somebody is not doing well and you want to capture their seizures, they have drug-resistant epilepsy, you want to see what, you know, want to confirm the diagnosis, you want to see where the interictal activity is and where the ictus is coming from and see whether the interictal activity is exactly matching. Does it make sense? Do they have more frontal lobe looking seizures or parietal lobe seizures? Do they have non-epileptic seizures? Do they have some other kind of movement disorder a thing and we want to capture not just one episode. We want to capture at least, uh, again, three is a magic number. You want to capture at least three stereotyped events and make sure that one seizure you captured is not coming from the right side and the other is not coming from the left side. You can do the same EEG recording, not through the scalp, but directly into the brain. And you can do it very superficially, or you can go deep in the brain and try to capture some EEG data or you can just open the brain for whatever reasons when you're dissecting and the, the neurosurgeon will put just two electrodes over the surface of the cortex, which is called corticography. Then once you've determined that this is epilepsy, then what are, you, what are options do you have? Either you can use medications and stay with the medication. There are about 34 medications and you can spend patients whole life treating them with medication and praying to God that maybe this combination will work. But you can also do surgical resection. So either you can identify a focus, you can resect that focus, or you say, no, I'm going to do some less invasive surgery. I'm going to ablate that focus either with laser uh, you know, thing or radio frequency. So it will definitely be a less invasive surgery. Or you say that, you know, I cannot resect it because it is in an area which is really important to the brain, whether it's a language area, visual area, sensory or, uh, you know, primary motor cortex, because it is directly overlapping with that eloquent cortex, can I modulate it? And that concept is called neuromodulation. There are some candidates who have drug resistant epilepsy, but not everyone will be able to go for surgery. 
I'll give you an example of that AVM that I just showed you. That is in an insular or eloquent area on the dominant side. And people are afraid to touch these, you know, these congenital lesions. You know, if the young patient comes to you, says that this, they have this AVM, there is always a risk of hemorrhage in that AVM, which, which like accumulative incidence every year, um, but still you're afraid of resecting it or you're afraid of even doing like a radio surgery in those lesions, which is in the eloquent cortex. So there are some alternative therapies like a diet therapy. We have a dietitian at, um, at Mount Sinai. So you can, um, it has been studied in the past that when people were fasting, their seizures got better. So John Hopkins, who is a big proponent of um, ketogenic diet, what they advise patients is that if most of your diet has predominantly fats and very limited carbs and you know, limited uh, proteins, so the ketogenic diet um, is usually four is to one ratio for four portions of fat and one of carbohydrate. It's very stringent diet. So, you know, there are modified versions of it, like modified Atkins diet, which allows you to eat more carbs, but you can also have a diet which, uh, or, you know, depend on, you know, some kind of foods which have what we call low glycemic index. There are times when in refractory status epilepticus, when we suspect that there is an autoimmune encephalitis or when conventional inter anti seizure medications have completely failed and patients have what we call super refractory status epilepticus, they are still seizing despite they are on Versed and propofol and ketamine, you name it. Then we go to a different route. We treat them with steroids, IVIG, plasma exchange without even knowing that it is definitely an autoimmune condition. We treat them with vagal nerve stimulator, or we tell our patients that we have, you know, use different kind of mechanism of action, different drugs with different mechanism of action, and they have all failed. So, you know, Columbia is, or this hospital is doing these investigational drug trials, and we offer that to them. So when I choose a drug, there are a lot of things go into my thoughts, like what is the age of the patient? Um, do they fit into an epilepsy syndrome? And does any drug work better for that epilepsy syndrome than the others? What is their predominant seizure type? Do they have multiple seizure types or just one seizure type? If it is focal, I try to use narrow spectrum drug. If it is more combination of focal and generalized, I try to use more broad spectrum drug. When I don't know by history, I again go with the broad spectrum drug. Then are they totally drug naive? So there is a good 50% chance that you try your first drug and they will never have a seizure again and they don't need to see an epileptologist. But one third of the patients will have drug resistant epilepsy and will continue to have seizures. Child bearing potential age group women with epilepsy always crosses my mind, you know, will the, will the anti-epileptic drug interact with the oral contraceptive pill? Will it lower the efficacy of the oral contraceptive pills? when they get pregnant, you know, they should be walking out of my office with the folic acid um, because that has definitely shown that it decreases the risk of teratogenicity and also decreases the risk of, um, you know, a child born with a lower IQ. And then there are certain drugs that I totally stay away from in, in, in women with uh, epilepsy. And one such good example is it's Depakote because it is, it is the worst one in the field of epilepsy, it causes neural tube defects, it causes spina bifida defects, it decreases the IQ by at least uh, six points and in children born to mothers who have epilepsy and were taking Depakote. It's always dose dependent, so don't get me wrong, if somebody is on just 500 milligram of Depakote, probably will not have a child with the neural tube side effect. But also things like, you know, when they reach menopause, worried about, you know, using enzyme inducing drugs and worry about their bone health, like osteopenia, osteoporosis. Or when, um, remember one thing that usually it is, um, the estrogen is considered at what we call pro-convulsant and um, progesterone is protective and it's anti-convulsant. So 
there are different phases of menstrual cycle where women is more prone to epilepsy. And if their seizure frequency doubles down around the time when they have their periods um, and perimenstrual uh, cycle uh, around that time, they get more seizures that's called catamenial epilepsy. And there are different ways of treating that too. Um, but other things besides the oral contraceptive, uh, you know, efficacy, you know, that how anti-seizure medicines lower the efficacy of the oral contraceptive pills. You know, we worried about the clearance of these medications during first, second, or third trimester. One drug like lamotrigine, um, their concentration decreases by 200, 300% during pregnancy. So you, you watch the levels more carefully during pregnancy. Then other things that how the drug is going to be excreted in breast milk. Um, it, it is inversely proportional to the protein binding. So some of the older drugs, which had a very, very high protein binding, they don't have that much excretion versus Keppra, which is, has least protein binding, will have more excretion. Um, similarly with phenobarbital and other drugs too. So all those things are really important in, in women with epilepsy throughout um, their, you know, from the adolescence to all the way to menopause. Some women who have catamenial epilepsy, they will notice that around their menopause, their seizures will get better, but for a, for a short period, perimenstrual time, they might get worse. And, and during pregnancy, again, there is a one third rule. Some people have unchanged frequency, some have uh, do better, some get worse. And some women will exclusively have seizures during pregnancy and never in between the pregnancy. Um, then, you know, other things that come to mind is that what are the other drugs this patient is on? Is, is this anti-seizure medicine the only monotherapy he's taking, he or she is taking, or they are on a bunch of other drugs and they're, you know, some drugs like Keppra and Gabapentin really um, shine because they do not interact with the other medications. All older medications have more, um, especially enzyme inducers, will definitely interfere with Coumadin, will interfere with chemotherapy, will interfere with your um, other, uh, you know, statins will lower the efficacy of these statins. Um, and then the comorbid conditions, they can sometimes work in your favor. You can, you know, uh, kill two birds with one stone kind of thing. And then the genetics matter, you know, there are people who have increased risk of rash, especially Asian Han Chinese people who will um, have increased risk of Steven Johnson syndrome with Tegretol or with Lamictal. Um, the history of what other medicines they took in the past is important. If you call me from the emergency room that this patient has allergic reaction from dilantin, phenobarbital, primidone, what should we do? I would pick up something which doesn't have that same exact benzene ring, which will cause increased risk of rash. So there is some cross sensitivity between the drugs and um, it, it's better to pick up something which pharmacologically looks totally different. And one such example is, is like Depakote. Also in this case, again, our tuberous sclerosis patient, um, instead of using ACTH because this patient had infantile spasm, I might use a drug called Vigabatrin, also called Sabril, uh, because it has been shown that Vigabatrin really works for these tubers. So, you know, we have different uh, anti-seizure medicine. They have different mechanism of actions. And all these medicines have different like sodium channel. They are, you know, increasing the uh, GABA there because excitation, um, inhibition, imbalance is what is what epilepsy is all about. So can we um, use certain drugs which are anti-glutamate? Can we use something which is more anti-NMD, anti-AMPA? Um, or can we modulate the H channels, which is like, it's kind of a depolarization trigger when neurons are in the hyperpolarization phase. So, um, you know, picking up drugs against H channels is also important or something that people are interested in. 
You guys know the levetiracetam and Breviact has totally different mechanism of action. It goes after the synaptic vesicle 2A. Um, the only drug that I know which works is the potassium channel, which is no longer in use because it turned people blue is what we call isogabine. And then there is an increased interest in the cannabidiol or what we, the medicine, which is FDA regulated, it's called epidiolex. It doesn't bind to the cannabinoid receptors, but it, it, it has a receptors, which is called the G coupled proteins and transient receptor potential. So totally a new mechanism of action that we didn't even know about. You know, general rule, especially in critically ill patients, you wanna know that which are predominantly hepatically uh, metabolized, which ones through the liver, uh, which are less hepatic metabolism and which are more extra hepatic. So that if person has renal or hepatic issues, you stay away from some of the drugs. So be aware of the drug to drug interaction. Some, a few I will mention here, a Depakot and phenobarbital. So Depakot always, it's an inhibitor. It's, it's a major inhibitor. Other dilantin, carbamazepine, primidone, they are all inducers. So it Depakot inhibits the metabolism of the phenobarbital. So it increases the level of phenobarbital. When you're using these two drugs together, do more levels to see how it is affecting the phenobarbital. Depakot, as you know, can cause hepatic issues. It can cause thrombocytopenia, tremors, but also Depakot, if combined with Topamax, can cause what we call hyperammonemic encephalopathy. So if a patient with the Depakot comes with an abdominal pain, think of the life-threatening conditions like pancreatitis. Um, Depakot can also cause what we call pseudo-Parkinsonism kind of a syndrome. Um, it also is not a great drug to use in anybody who is older than, uh, who is younger than two years of age because the microsomal P450 system is still immature. Other drugs which can be synergistic. And one such example is Depakot and Lamictal, but they have major drug to drug interactions. Depakot being an inhibitor will inhibit the metabolism of lamotrigine. So it will raise the lamotrigine level. So if those be, if patients are on these two drugs, you need to do the levels and see how those drug interactions are. Sometimes a side effect of the medications can work in your favor. So if you have a, somebody who is a little heavy set, also has migraine and also has epilepsy, then you can pick up drugs like Topomax and Zanisamide versus somebody who is losing weight and you want them to gain some weight. You can use drugs like Arbamazepine, Kepra or uh, Trileptal, which can cause a little more weight gain. Um, try to avoid certain drugs when patients have very bad migraines. So try to avoid activating medications like Felbitol or uh, Lamotrigine. And always in older patients go low and slow. And even in adult patients, those who are very sensitive to medicine, it doesn't hurt to you know, stay low. Um, special population considerations I already talked to you about in detail. So um, can teach you all <laughs> anti-epileptic drugs in one lecture, but uh, a patient with myoclonic status comes to you. So always, always avoid these sodium channel blockers. All these, uh, especially these three, or I should say phenytoin and carbamazepine are narrow spectrum drugs. Lamotrigine is more broad spectrum, but stay away from these drugs and use more broad spectrum drugs. So we do, you know, we load them with Kepra, we load them with Depakot, uh, but you can use in status, you don't have to use 50 milligram once daily dose of Tomax, you can go straight to 200 milligram BID. You're not worried about the cognitive effect of Tomax in status, right? And high dose of uh, clonazepam can also be used. So I, I briefly mentioned some of the new medications. So we, on the right side, we have all these extended release medications. Um, Oxtilar for oxcarbazepine, trocandy for tro topomax, uh, long preparation for dilantin. You have the delayed release and the extended release. Um, sorry for the spelling error, but Lamictal, Kepra, everything is available in uh, Integritol, Xtar, um, and Carbitrol. Sorry for some of these spelling errors. Um, on the left side, 
I have certain drugs that you may or may not have used. So lacosamide is, is very increasingly used in, in our um, you know, ICU patients and in outpatient settings. The unique mechanism of lacosamide is that most of the other sodium channel blockers, they work against fast sodium channel blockers. Lacosamide or Wimpad is the only one which works against slow sodium channel blockers. So when you use these drugs with fast sodium channel blockers like dilantin, carbamazepine, always be aware that patient may get a little more dizzy. Not a great idea to combine it, but if you have to combine it, you combine it, but you then be aware of that interaction. Clobazam or Onfi is a benzodiazepine, so it works very well for anxiety and seizures, and it works very well for certain kind of childhood syndromes where it is FDA approved for those indications. It is a slightly different from other benzodiazepines and it has less addicting potential or habit forming potential. It is a 1,3 covalent bond, most of the other benzodiazepines, 1,5, sorry, covalent bond, and that's how it got the name on fee, 1 and 5, O, o N and uh, on fee. Uh, others are more one, two, three. Then there is a drug called Excopri, also called Cenobamate, which is uh, for focal epilepsy. In studies, it has shown that it has a very high retention rate compared to other drugs. Fenfloramine and Steropentol, they are used more in children for Dravet syndrome, which is a very high risk of sudden unexplained, unexplained death in epilepsy. Fenfloramine was initially used for weight loss and but you know, there are some kind of a cardiac valvular defects that you need to worry about with the funfloropine. Vigabatrin for tuberous sclerosis, um, also called Sabril. And then we have a new drug, which is more for the generalized epilepsy, which has a very, very long half-life. So these, any drug with long half-life can be given as a single dose, which can work in your favor if somebody is non-compliant. It improves the compliance if it is um, more like a long acting one time dose. Uh, Perampinil, also called Phycompa, um, it's it is used for generalized epilepsy. So, something we didn't have for a long time uh, for generalized epilepsies. Uh, so, it's a broad spectrum medicine. Rafenamide, again, is used for atonic seizures, also called Banzel in children. Um, Esli carbazepine is a third generation medication. So we started with uh, carbamazepine, um, Tegridol, and then it had these horrible neurotoxic side effects. And we said, okay, we're gonna make trileptal ox carbazepine, second generation drug. We're gonna modify uh, the epoxide, which causes neurotoxicity. And then it's a third generation when the, ox, the carbamazepine and Oxcarbazepine started giving hyponatremia. They came up with this drug called Aptium SD carbazepine, very well tolerated. Um, is it more efficacious? It definitely causes less sodium problems, especially in elderly patients who are on Lasix. That is something you don't want to use. Um, trileptal and trileptal somehow causes more hyponatremia than the the regular carbamazepine. Tiagabine is something that we use for patients with cerebral palsy who had bad epilepsy, but also had a lot of spasticity. And it's a very good anti-spastic agent. So instead of using Xenoflex or Baclofen for spasticity, we, we try to use this for epilepsy as well as spasticity. Isogabine came and just gone. Uh, Breviact is um, something that I use in patients who have uh, behavioral problems. So it's like brevaracetam, which is same as levetiracetam. So it, it's used um, when people have behavioral issues with Keppra, but they did very well on Keppra. And then the Epidiolex, which is more um, FDA regulated cannabidiol, um, which we talked about briefly in the past. So there are new rescue therapies that are available. And two, I would like you to know is that we always had this uh, rectal gel diazepam, which was kind of at times uh, inconvenient and socially embarrassing. And these are the rescue therapies where what do we use at home, which will prevent status epileptic is what do we use before arrival to our emergency rooms? So patients who have what we call febrile status epilepticus, who have prolonged seizures, who have a lot of cluster of seizures, we tend to use, um, we used to use a diazepam rectal gel. But now there are nasal preparations. It's always believed that the rectal 
plexus, vascular plexus improves the absorption of these drugs and has more bioavailability compared to the nasal, but these are easier to give. Say if somebody in a plane is having, you know, a prolonged seizure. So the families can keep these nasal spray. So these were recently came out and Nazilam, which is nasal medazolam is approved for more than 12 years in older patients. And the other uh, diazepam nasal form is also called Valtaco. Um, that's approved for anybody older than six years of age. We've always used clonazepam buffers for cluster of seizures and for catamenial epilepsy, but there are other medications which we are working on in clinical trials like alprazolam or buccal uh, clobazam. There has been a recent um, you know, study which, um, which looked at uh, three, in 384 patients, children as well as adults, and they used different doses of these three medications to see that when somebody feels benzodiazepine, which is the drug to go to, and definitely they used uh, phosphenidine at 20 milligram, valproate at 40, and levetiracetam at 60. Um, and then probably there were more hypotension and more cardiac arrhythmias with phosphenidine, which doesn't surprise you, it's a sodium channel blocker. And the penetration, because valproate is a very uh, fat-soluble drug, was slightly faster um, with the valproate and with the Keppra because it binds to the synaptic vesicle protein. Uh, so they were quite equivalent, except for the hypotension that I mentioned with the phosphenitoin. Um, but valproate kind of uh, took a little more edge. It's broad spectrum. Uh, so we'll work for more focal as well as generalized epilepsy, uh, but they were pretty equivalent. So then comes that, how do we define what is we call drug resistant epilepsy? How do we pick up these patients very quickly and uh, you know, do the proper uh, counseling for these patients? So if you have failed two anti-seizure medicine, the chances that you will respond to a third or a 23rd or 34th medicine, it becomes less than really, really in single teens, like one to five percent. So um, once you have failed to medication, it's time to send them to an epilepsy monitoring unit. And if somebody is on polytherapy and they have failed that trial, um, then probably they, we are dealing with the drug resistant epilepsy. And why drug resistant epilepsy is a genetic or they have some tight junction, just like in cancer cells where chemotherapy is not working. So some tight direct junctions or overexpression of some peak glycoproteins that medicine is being given, but is not going in the brain. So despite the advent of these many first generation, second generation and third generation, we have not seen um, the trends that the drug resistant epilepsy is going down, it is still the same. So we have about 65 million people who have epilepsy and at least 3.5 in USA with these many children affected and one third continue to have seizure, but less than 1% of those drug resistant, they make it to hospital, uh, to, drug uh, to epilepsy monitoring units. So suppose that one third, 1 million in USA has drug resistant epilepsy, not everybody is gonna be a surgical candidate um, but if these many people are surgical candidates, 100,000 to 200,000, only we, we are performing only about, what, 3,000 surgical procedures. So do we need to look at different targets? You know, neuroinflammation and epilepsy uh, looks at prostaglandin and all these, um, you know, inflammatory markers that I have listed on the left side. Uh, should we focus less on channel blockers we know that there is a you know differential distribution of um, ion channels. Um, you know, there's very asynchronous and very irregular distribution in the dendrites compared to the main cell body or soma that we call it. So, um, are there some drugs which are more effective in dendritic spines versus the soma? And before we say label it as a drug resistant epilepsy, we want to make sure it's not pseudo resistant, that patient is not compliant, is it's a totally wrong diagnosis they're taking, they're not on the right drug for the right kind of epilepsy. So anything, any epilepsy which is generalized and you using something which is a drug for focal epilepsy can actually worsen generalized epilepsy. So carbamazepine being used in 
juvenile myoclonic epilepsy can do more harm than good. So you want to make sure that all those things are taken care of. And sometimes in patients who have very sporadic mild epilepsy, things like lifestyle issues, you know, if you go out not taking your medicine, drinking out, alcohol provocation, all that can cause breakthrough seizure. So that should come into mind. I'm going to quote this study because it is mostly quoted for, you know, since it came out in uh, New England Journal and there are newer versions of this and, and even more patients who were followed. But uh, that's the point I wanted to make that you pick up one drug, you hope that 47% will be seizure free. Um, that doesn't work or you add it as an adjunctive 13% 30, 30 more, 13 more patients you think will uh, become seizure free. But as you go more and more, the chances of becoming seizure free with more trials is, is just a waste of uh, time. So what do we do when we do pre-surgical evaluation of drug resistant epilepsy? We do good quality MRIs, we do video EGs, we look at their blood flow. If somebody has a left temporal or lobe epilepsy and I do a PET scan, which also shows low metabolism in the left side, everything is like concordantly uh, tying to one piece, I feel more comfortable that this is left side and I'm not worried about the right sided focus. We do functional MRIs and WADA testing, functional MRIs looking at the language area, somatosensory areas or other eloquent cortex. As I told you that the EEG is very good for looking at the radial uh, dipoles. So there is a thing called magnetoencephalogram, which is very good at looking at the tangential dipoles, which are not very well picked up on the um, on our standard scalp EEG, um, you know, whatever way you are obtaining it, either continuous or ambulatory or a standard EEG. We look at the metabolites, some of the mitochondrial disorders, um, you know, the MRS can be helpful. We do a very detailed three to four hour different set, you know, sessions of uh, detailed um, neuropsychological testing, looking at, you know, how is their attention span, how is their executive functioning, how is uh, their visual memory, how is their verbal memory. You definitely want to do surgery in patients who have good social support, and you want to make sure that you evaluate them for any depression or anxiety. I'll briefly mention what the WADA testing is, which is a language memory testing, which is a, like a cerebral angiogram. You put half of the brain to sleep so that you're only functioning um, only one half of the brain. So suppose they give me some kind of a sodium amybarbital and my left brain is totally put to sleep, probably I'll become aphasic and I will have a right hemiplegia for a few seconds, uh, for a few minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. And during that time when I'm aphasic, that tells the doctors that the left side is important for language. If I get bilateral functioning language arrest when the right side was injected, then it tells the doctor that there is bilateral representation of the language. And then visual memory is more important going from one A to B. Um, it's more of a function of the right side of the brain and the verbal memory, remembering the names of the people. Um, all that is more left-sided functions. So they go into the details that suppose the surgery needs to be performed on the left side of the brain what are my limitations? Will patient be able to support their memory um, if I take the left camp, hippocampus out? So suppose there is a disease part of the brain, you expect that the memory on the left side of the brain will be zero um, versus the right side, which is not affected at all, uh, can be perfect. So it's, you know, we show different objects, 12 objects, and then we try to grade it that how is the memory on the right side? How is the memory on the left side? Coming to the surgery. So either you see a lesion and you remove it, or you say, no, that the, around the lesion, there are areas which can be epileptogenic. And should I remove and do more extended lesionectomy? Or there are lesions just limited to one gyrus or just a you know, outer part of the cortex. So we do the gyrectomy and topectomy. If it is a really multi-lobar lesion, sometimes we do what we call hemispherectomy. Like a good example will be Rasmussen's encephalitis, people with Sturge Weber syndrome, people who have hemimegalencephaly. So the whole cortical malformation, the cortical dysplasia that I talked about involving the whole brain. Corpus callosotomy is like you're severing the 
fibers, corpus callosum allows the two parts of the brain to communicate. So either with the laser or with the, you know, transection, you are trying to do corpus callosotomy. And that's done for patients who have these drop attacks where parents have zero second to just hold their child. So for atonic, tonic seizures, uh, corpus callosotomy is done. It's also done for patients who have very frequent GDCs because they have a high risk of um, pseudo. Then comes that, you know, if it is in an eloquent cortex and you can't remove it, can you transect the fibers, the association fibers of the brain in a way that you keep the integrity, the function of the brain, um, the radial orientation of those neurons, but you see there the association fibers, uh, which are promoting the propagation of these seizures. And that's something what we call multiple sub PL transaction. And then if you cannot resect it, you cannot ablate it, can you neuromodulate it? And then we have three different options that we have. One is vagal nerve stimulation, responsive neurostimulation, and deep brain stimulation. We have less and less invasive surgeries like focused ultrasound, as well as the laser interstitial therapy or radiofrequency thermocoagulation. So we know from these three papers, both in adults as well as in children, that surgery works for temporal lobe epilepsy, which is drug resistance where two medications have failed. The chances that it will work is close to 70 to 90% in patients who have a very peculiar finding, what we call mesial temporal sclerosis. But it works for other, other etiologies too. If you have, even if you have a totally normal MRI, they will not do as well as the mesial temporal sclerosis patients do, but still it, it works for um, other, you know, extra temporal epilepsy for frontal lobe epilepsy. So why um, we still do not perform surgery when, and it has been what this paper came out back in 2000 and we are in 2021 and still we are performing very small number of cases um, who could be eligible and be benefited by epilepsy. So I'm trying to show you that what do we actually do when we do epilepsy? So we do a craniotomy. This is an old way of doing more invasive surgeries. And we put a grid. So this is a chain of electrodes, whatever number of electrodes it has. And then we put small little strips. So suppose the patient I know has temporal, I'll put a big grid and I'll try to make a brain map, what we call an, a seizure map. A seizure map, suppose only these six electrodes in the bottom, they get involved. That is my seizure map, that when seizure starts, I see the activity starts here. And then I stimulate all these electrodes, you know, bedside, and see if patient has any symptoms. And I say, okay, I checked this electrode. This was totally inert. Patient didn't complain of anything. Or no, I did this. I stimulated this electrode and patient had a language arrest. So I do a functional map and I do a seizure map and I show it to the neurosurgeon. The neurosurgeon tries to take out that seizure map electrodes, which get involved. They can't remove the whole brain. So they do what we call temporal lobectomy and they stay away from the functional areas where I got the bad hits where there was an eloquent cortex. So that's a, quite a painful invasive surgery. So we started doing in USA, uh, you know, we started this in France way, way more than, you know, many, many years before we started in USA. These small little electrodes, these are called depth electrodes. So what if somebody has, you know, seizure focus on both sides of the brain, you can do craniotomy on both sides of the brain, but you can put these small electrodes through um, a robot um, and you can cover bilateral areas, you can cover, um, you know, eloquent cortices. Briefly on, I'm looking at the time, so you're almost near the end. So the VNS, um, usually we do a pacemaker on the left side of the chest, um, nothing is seen outside and it loops around the vagus through the, around the tractor solitarius nucleus, and it has broad projections to different parts of the brain. So it is a kind of a open loop where you're not getting any EEG recording. you just have some parameters that it is few minutes on, few minutes off, and, and nobody really knows the mechanism of VNS, but it desynchronizes the force that is needed uh, to form seizures, you know, different neurons, 
you know, firing at different times, but unless there is a paroxysmal depolarization shift and synchronization, you're not going to transform into a seizure. So it desynchronizes that force. The RNS is beneath the scalp, but within the skull here, again, you don't see anything, but it also has these electrodes, which can be a small little strip. Um, for this, this is usually done when you identify the seizure focus, but you cannot remove it. Uh, but at least you can cover the area where you have, you know, with the stereo EG, as I mentioned, this is called stereo EG. You have determined one or two foci, you cannot take care of it. So you record it. And based on what recording, it's like a 24 seven recording in the brain going on for many, many years. You can see how slowly the brain modulates and you can have different parameters. And then is a DBS that which we have used in, um, you know, movement disorder uh, arena for a long time, we use it for Parkinson's disease, for tremors and other things. So the anterior nucleus of thalamus is the main thalamus, which has, uh, which is um, incriminated in, in limbic epilepsy. So you go after that, um, you know, the target called the anterior nucleus thalamus. With the laser, you can discharge the patient next day. So with mesial temporal sclerosis, it really works well, but also for focal cortical dysplasia, for some kind of a tumor, hypothalamic hematomas, which are deep-seated, um, also for cavernous malformations. So there is a big lantern study going on to see the effectiveness of the um, laser interstitial therapy. And, you know, we have used it for different kinds of lesions. We have exciting things like, you know, seizure diary maps, seizure tracker apps, uh, smart watches where we can, uh, you know, monitor and improve the safety of our patients, including a smart watch, which, a smart watch, which will alert the doctors uh, and the parents that the patient had a seizure. We have better tools in our EG armamentarium where, um, in ICUs or, um, you know, neurosurgical ICUs, we can literally look at five patients and see that who is seizing, as you see in the right um, histogram. Instead of focusing on six, five may not be seizing, one may be seizing. We can have more what, what of a visual graphic representation of when they had the seizure. We have different tools. This one we used called, used by Cerebral, which is um, used in COVID uh, patients because we wanted to decrease the time that our EG techs were uh, exposed to COVID patients because it's like it takes one hour to place electrodes. So we use this eight electrodes um, in the neurosurgical ICO. But there are different ways where you don't have to use glue or goop in your hair and you get good EG recording. There is a subcutaneous way of recording the EG called UN EG and the Zito EG. And then you know, if you cannot help these patients, can you at least do something so that they don't have awareness, loss of awareness? And, and that's if some you guys are interested in how do we, you know, prevent awareness of consciousness during temporal lobe seizures, you should watch this uh, National Geographic series. And with that, I'm going to end in the interest of the time and not to talk about this SUDAP that much. So um, my final thoughts in this, that there's so much we can do about educating our patients with epilepsy, what kind of first aid the family should give, you know, rescue therapies and things like that. And, um, you know, try to figure it out that which patients have these, what subtle seizures who were not diagnosed for many years before they sought some kind of a treatment. Um, I went to, in a train to India and there were like only, only phenobarbital available, no CAT scan or no MRIs available. So how do we bridge the gap in other countries? And, um, you know, how, you know, definitely all these new medications are very expensive. Some are controlled substances need approval. They have to be sent to the pharmacy almost every year. And how do we prevent sudden and unexplained death in epilepsy? Uh, which in certain syndromes is more often, but anybody who has more than three GTCs in a year has much higher incidence of sudden ex unexplained death. Drug-resistant epilepsy patients have a higher incidence. And then do we have a better understanding of what targets? Is it just the anterior nucleus? The thalamus has 60 different nuclei. Which one is the most ideal target. Um, if you cannot find a source where seizures are coming from, because they are so diffuse, uh, can we just, you know, tackle their 
main modulator, uh, the main orchestrator of, uh, you know, which gets involved. So hippocampus as a alternative to anterior nucleus or cerebellum, they, this is all in the air. And then the newer therapy should they focus on a different mechanism of action. And with that, I'll thank you guys again for this opportunity and, you know, sharing all this information with you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Singh, for a comprehensive review of the, all the material. And it's a time, but we do have one question in the chat, and I think it would be good. Um, extended release drugs usually do not provide a steady level of drug, and non-extended release drugs certainly do not. Is that a problem in some patients? Yes, yeah, so the you know definitely the extended release tablets are much more expensive. And patients will give you their different experience. Some people say, hey, I, I like my Tegridol and not the Tegridol XR. But, you know, there are peaks and troughs. So when, when we do the level, I tell my patients, can we do the level first thing in the morning so that we don't have random levels? And, um, and can you take your first medication of the morning right after the blood is drawn? So I presume that it's more consistent level that I'm tracing, right? But... You know, these, when, when, when the drug level drops, you're at increased risk of seizures. And when you are at the highest of the peak, you're at the increased risk of side effects. And there are some sensitive patients who will miss their one dose and will have a seizure and will get injured. Versus there are others who, you know, thankfully don't have much um, side effects. So, you know, all those things, they do, do play a role. And I, I think the best way to have a, some sense of the level is to do it consistently around the same time and just before they take your medicine. Great, thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for a really comprehensive talk around epilepsy. Really appreciate you coming today. And thanks everyone for coming to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds and see you next week.